Anyway, welcome. I'm so glad you're with us. I invite you to turn to Ezekiel chapter 37. Uh, it's the last week of our series. Uh, we're talking about love can live again, and about relationships in our lives. And uh, so I encourage you, Ezekiel chapter 37. Uh, what we've been doing the last few weeks has been turning our attention specifically to the broken relationships in our lives, that there are relationships in our lives that are not where they should be. Um, we sense that God has told us it's time to deal with them, that it's, we can't just allow them to persist, that God wants to revive them, that there's a process to this, that God wants to speak into those places in our lives where there is just relational brokenness, uh, perhaps even death, relationships that look like just dead bones in a valley. And God has given this vision to this guy named Ezekiel. He says, I'm going to give you a vision of what I do, of how it works. And uh, he says, first, you need to believe that I can do this, right? And so he asked the question, can these bones live again? So in the relationships in your life, the very first question is, can God do that? As Caitlin said before, there's that mountain, that challenge, that obstacle in your life. Can God really change it? Like, think of the most impossible relationship. You're like, oh, there is no coming back from that one. Can God? That's the first question. Do you think I can? Because it's about faith, belief. That's the first step. And then he says, okay, well, if you're going to take that step, if not, you walk away and that's it. But if you say, okay, God, I believe you can, then the next thing is, okay, then speak to the bones. Speak it out. Don't just say it up here, but literally say it out loud. Put that faith in action. And when we do that, what happens is that begins to align us. That begins to align our lives. And what it does is it puts God at his rightful p place as first and foremost over everything. So he becomes, and the bones begin to line up. And that's what happens is there was a rattling sound. And the bones in this vision, the bones actually begin to align. And then last week, we talked about how God then begins to connect muscles and, and flesh, and he begins to restore that connective tissue, the relationship. Okay, now it's not just alignment, but now God begins to put back in place connection, that there is a relationship being formed where there was none. Now there could be a conversation. There could be a reaching out. There's this gradual reconnection of things because bones by themselves can't move. Muscles always work in twos, remember? They can only they can only pull, they cannot push. So everybody remember, make your muscle. We make the muscle like this. Everybody do it, just do it. Here we go, like this. All right, everybody make, okay, you guys had two muscles, just worked, right? So what happened is your bicep just pulled. Now if you want to put your arm straight out, your tricep just pulled. That they work in twos. That's how this works. Muscles, it takes two in the relationship. So God begins to put those, and we said we were hopefully going to hear stories. So I don't know if anybody has had anything, but anybody want to just, you don't have to say anything, but just say something happened in my life where there was some connection where there was something that happened anybody anybody oh look at we got hands all over all right look at this is awesome all right we said God's going to begin to do that stuff but here's the deal bones are awesome and muscles are awesome but that's not enough that's not enough and so we get to Ezekiel chapter 37 in verse 8 and this is what we read it says this then as I watched muscles and flesh formed over the bones then skin formed to cover their bodies but they still had no breath in them. All we have now at this point is Frankenstein's monster laying on the table, right? Bolts sticking out and all this kind of stuff, right? Like it's just a body. It's got flesh. It's got muscles. It's got all the parts, but there's no life in it. So we've done what we can do. We've believed, we've prayed, we've spoken, we've put all our faith in God, and still there's nothing but a valley filled with bodies. It's just bodies. They're there, but there's no life in them. And it reveals this truth. For all our efforts, here it is, for all your efforts, you can't will a relationship back to life. No matter how hard you work, no matter how many right things you do, no matter how much you believe in God, no matter how much you try to restore the relationship, no matter how many times you try to reach out and do all those things, and some of us have tried. We have certainly tried. We've put all the work in. We've done those things. Perhaps for years you have tried to will a relationship 
to life. And you've tried counseling and therapy. You've done everything imaginable. You've spent more money than you, more time. You have invested so much emotional. You are exhausted because you have poured so much in it, and you cannot make that relationship live. It's not to say that the counseling and all those things aren't valuable, that they, don't have, they, they have a place. There's a part that God uses all of that stuff. That's fine. We simply don't have what it takes to bring relationship to life. That's the point. No amount of our own effort can bring to life what is dead. Still, they had no breath in them, right? So what do we do with that? Have a great week, everybody. Just good luck, you know, with your bodies. I don't know. I mean, like, like why does God tell us to speak to those things if we can't change them? Like, what's the point? What's he doing there? And the point is this. God's not done yet. There's still one final step in this process, and that's what we're looking at today. So just the very next verse, Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 9, so we read this, and it says, Then God said to me, Speak a prophetic message to the winds, son of man. Speak a prophetic message. And just for the record, prophetic message, like when we hear those words, it's kind of like, what does that even mean? We just It's a Bible word, and it can be a little confusing. Like, what's a prophetic message? That means speak what I tell you to speak. It's a word from God that he's telling you to speak out. It's God speaking through you. All, is it, all it means is you're being God's mouthpiece. That's all it means. It doesn't mean it has to do with the future. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't, like, it's not, like, prophetic. It's always future. Sometimes they're future-oriented, so we've come to associate prophetic messages with things that are going to happen in the future. He was prophetic, right? We, we use that language. But that's not necessarily, by definition, what it means. It literally means you are just a prophet. You are speaking on behalf of God. He has given you a message. He says, speak this out. So when he says, speak it, he said, tell him, say what, I, say what I tell you to say in the New Jersey. That's what he says. Speak a prophetic message and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. This is what I'm saying. All right. Come, O breath, from the four winds. Breathe into these dead bodies so they may live again. Verse 10, so I spoke the message as he commanded me, and breath came into their body. And they all came to life and stood up on their feet, a great army. I don't know that, like, today we really understand what that was like to experience firsthand. Could you imagine, like, watching bones align and watching muscles form? I shared, like, a little video on our base camp channel, if you saw it, of a friend of mine, like, a decade ago who put some little yeah, graphic video together. And it was pretty cool to see all that kind of stuff. Gives you a little visual. Um, but then at the end, it's just one guy. I'm like, no, it sounds like an army. There's like all these people standing up. Um, I don't think they had the budget for that. Um, but it's this idea that like imagine like all these bodies and all of a sudden you just see like breath, like something about breath in a body. The final step in God's process of bringing the dead back to life is to put breath in them. The Hebrew word for breath is, well, I like to say ruah, but it's actually ruach. That's how you say it in the Hebrew, ruach. All right, it's the same word. So it's the same exact word used for spirit and for wind. Breath, spirit, wind. Same word, almost interchangeable throughout the entire Old Testament in Hebrew. You speak to the wind, speak to the spirit, speak to the life-giving breath of God is what he's saying. So he's saying, speak to the wind, speak to my breath, speak to the spirit. And specifically, it's really interesting. He says this, speak to the four winds. Isn't that a cool phrase? Speak to the four winds, not the three winds, the two, not the one, the four winds. It's like, what is, what's the deal with the four winds? Like, why is there a number to the winds? In those times, it was every direction, north, south, east, west, that the breath of God would come from every corner of creation. That this wasn't just a little bit of breath. God's not saying speak. He's saying speak to the life-giving wind of God that is everywhere. Speak to all of it. We're not told to ask for a tiny whiff. He didn't say ask for a gentle breeze, not a slight little gust. Speak to the wind that comes from every corner of creation. There's a profound power in the four winds. Do we understand? The four winds. Last week, what did we just so happen to have? A tornado in February in New Jersey. Come on. This is ridiculous. Like right here, we were literally, Vic and I were in the building. 
uh, while it was happening at our office, and a lady was there, and she got a picture, and you could see the funnel cloud. She took it over the town center lake. It was out into the right. Like, you could see the clouds. Like, this is nuts. Like, there's wind. If you've ever been anything like that, there's some serious power in wind. But that's just one little thing. I mean, I've seen Twister. You guys have seen Twister? Right? F5, right? The finger of God. Right? Like, there's some power. Now, imagine all of the tornadoes in all of the world, all the wind in the world, the four corners. Speak to the four winds. God's not saying, just speak a little breeze. All the wind in all the world, speak that in one focused location. Uh, There's power in this wind. And this wind doesn't just have power to kind of blow things around. Let's go back to the beginning of time for a minute. You go look at Genesis chapter 1, very beginning of the book. All the way to the beginning of the story, and it says this. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. What do we know about that word spirit? It also means what? Wind and breath. Same exact word. The ruach, the ruach of God was hovering in the beginning, very beginning of time. That wind, that breath. That spirit was hovering in creation. And then next chapter, when God created man, chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. And what did he do? He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils. And the man became a living person. He spirited into the man. He winded into the man. Like wind, he blew into the man. The wind gave life to the dust. See, wind is not just a swirl around, but it's a life-giving power. I want to pause. Last week, we talked about the muscular system, right? We did all our muscles and you have 600 muscles in your body, right? All those kind of things, and it's fascinating. This week, I want to talk about the respiratory system for just a minute. Breathing is fascinating. You're all doing it right now. <laughs> all of us right now. You're not, most of you are not even thinking about it. You're, you're not consciously thinking about it, but you are breathing in this moment, And we use a combination, if you remember last week, both our skeletal muscles. Everybody take a deep breath. You have control over that. That's your skeletal muscles. You chose to, your diaphragm, to to intake air and and breathe out. You chose to do that. Pump muscles, your upper airway, you have some of that. But then there's also smooth muscles that are working in in, in oxygen. Because once you breathe in and that air comes in, then you don't control it no more. It's just your body starts moving it around into other parts, Right? So here's the thing. We intake oxygen, travels down our airway, and splits off, here you go, into lots and lots of tiny little passageways into your heart, right? All these little things. There's like millions of them that it goes into it. And then what happens is that oxygenated blood is pumped from the heart into all of your body, and it goes through all your cells, and your cells need oxygen to live. That's how our body stays alive. And after our cells use the oxygen, so oxygen, we breathe it in, and then it gets dispersed throughout our whole body. That's basically a really simple way of doing it. I didn't go to school for science. Okay, so here you go. But that's what happens. And then after those cells use the oxygen in that blood, it breaks it down and it it turns into carbon dioxide. And all that stuff's in your body. That carbon dioxide is bad now because it's not good for your body. So what happens is every time you exhale, all, all so oxygen comes in. All, every time you're, that used oxygen is now coming back out is carbon dioxide. That's what happens. You breathe in oxygen, and carbon, the used up oxygen is coming out. Your body expels it. We're constantly filtering oxygen through our body all day long, your entire life. You have been doing this your whole life. Give yourself a hand. You've been doing a great job of breathing, right? It's really impressive what the body can do. Like you're a human filter constantly taking in life-giving oxygen, giving out carbon dioxide. Without oxygen, your cells can't survive. If you don't have oxygen in your body, within minutes, your entire body shuts down, saving your brain and your heart for last. But one by one, your organs start to shut down because there's not enough oxygen to keep them pumping. Your cells begin to die after minutes. Like You can try and hold your breath when you go underwater, but you know it, it gets bad after that. More than anything else, the human body relies on oxygen for survival. We can live without food. We can live without water, at least for extended times. You pi- apparently, you can live without donuts, I've heard. I've heard it said um, for a certain period of time. You can exist without light, without heat, without touch. But you need oxygen. You need oxygen. Nothing else 
within minutes of taking it away will you begin to be in danger of dying. Oxygen. God is the sustaining power of all life. His wind, his spirit, his breath. It's his breath in our lungs, right? We sing that song, his spirit that gives us his life, his wind that blows good into us, right? His spirit is our oxygen. It's that powerful, incredible, life-giving force. And it's what God has done throughout time is he sustains you. Every time you breathe in, that's God. Every time you breathe in, that's God. He is sustaining you and giving you life. Fast forward to the arrival of Jesus. Remember, it's not just to blow around, it's to give life. Jesus shows up on the scene. We know the Christmas story, right? Mary's there. And this says, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was, to be, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Greek now, we're in the New Testament, so now it's in Hebrew. Now it's Greek. The word there for the Holy Spirit is the same word used for wind and breath. Interesting. In Greek too, that word's called pneuma. The spirit, the breath, the wind of God. That new life always comes from God's breath, spirit, wind. Right? Earth, wind, fire. What do we got? Breath, spirit, wind. There we go. We got it's our, it's our Christian band. All right? We can play yeah, some music later. Um, Kevin can get on that. He's probably got some covers. Um, it happens to Adam. In the beginning, God breathes into him and he animates. It happened to Jesus. That's how Jesus comes on the scene. The Holy Spirit creates life. Jesus himself tells us he's talking to a Jewish religious leader named Nicodemus about what new life in God looks like, that it's not about what people do, rather what God does in them. Nicodemus is like, I don't understand. And Jesus says this, listen, humans can reproduce only human life. But the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. Listen, what's he say next? The wind blows where it wants. Just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it's going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. What Jesus was telling us here very simply is this. The Spirit of God gives new life that you can't accomplish and you also can't understand. It's a mystery. Remember, there's three. There's all those categories. There's paradoxes, things that don't make sense until you explore them a little further, right? And then there's uh, contradictions that they don't, they can't possibly coexist. And then there's mysteries, things that don't make sense and we'll never understand. It's just out there. He's saying that's what this is. This is a mystery. It's a truth. You can't grasp it. Doesn't mean it's not real. You're just not going to understand this. The Holy Spirit gives birth to spirit life. The spirit breathes into you, animates your life. Can't really, you just don't have the brain for it. Okay, that's it. Here's the point. When God says, speak to the four winds, he's telling you he wants to fill your life with life-creating power. He wants to breathe in you. He wants to put his wind, this powerful wind, not just a little bit. He wants to fill you with the power of his breath that brings life to what is dead. When he says, speak breath into things, He's saying, I am going to give life. You can't make that happen. He can. He can breathe into you, into your dead relationship with his breath, and it will come to life. Why are we so hopeless? Because we're trying to do it in our own strength. God says, hey, get out of the way. Let me breathe into those dead bodies. Yes, you've got bones. Yes, you've got muscles, but there's no life in them. But let me breathe into that. So it leads us to this question. Think about a broken relationship in your life. If you've been here for the past few weeks and you've been thinking about a relationship, or if it's your first time, think about a relationship in your life that this could apply to. Is there somebody in your life where you go, this relationship, I have, it's, it seems like it's dead. Now let me ask you, when you think about that relationship, here's the question. Who is breathing into it? Who are you banking on to bring life to that dead place? Are you waiting for the other person to do it? Have you put the weight of, re of resurrection on them? I'm just waiting for them to, to bring this thing back to life. Are you trying to do it? Are you trying to do everything in your power to will it to life? Are you trying to be the big bad wolf? Just breathing and breathing and breathing and I'm puffing and I'm puffing. You're giving everything you have to try to make it happen and it's not because you can't. 
But here's the thing. The longer we try to breathe into our relationships and our own strength, the longer we are depriving it of oxygen because we're just breathing carbon dioxide into it because that's all that we got. You can't breathe oxygen out. You only breathe it in. You can only give out carbon dioxide. The longer you try and breathe into it, the better it gets. You don't have that kind of power. None of us do. And here's why. Whatever we do comes from our own body. Again, in the Greek, I know I've got some Greek words in here, but I don't always do it. But this word sarks. Yeah. That's your flesh, your sinful nature, your body. So, yeah, you sarks. You know, like, <laughs> there's so much in there. I, sh- I could get in so many bad jokes. I will not do it. That's all on camera. Um, but here's what we need to know about our sarks, our body, our flesh, our spirit, us, is that we are always in opposition to the Spirit of God. What's in us is always in opposition. Whenever we attempt to operate with our own power, with our own wind, with our own breath, apart from God's Spirit, Paul tells us exactly what happens. He said this is what happens. Love starts to die. Galatians chapter 5. The sinful nature, the sarks, your body wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us the desires that are the opposite of what our flesh wants. The sinful nature wants. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. Do you feel that? Do you feel the struggle when you know, man, I know what's right, but there's this force in me in this relationship that just wants to stick it to him, that just wants to hold on to my pride, that just wants to serve myself, that just wants to take the easy way out, doesn't really want to give them an inch. This flesh is always opposed to what the Spirit wants. And here's what he says, makes it really clear, verse 19. When you follow the desires of your sarks, <laughs> of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like this. Your breath stinks. Everything that contributes to the death of relationships in your life comes from you. Everything that contributes to the death of a relationship comes from us. It's what happens when we try to sustain a relationship in our own power. We are breathing carbon dioxide into it all day long. When we operate in our own spirit, every relationship in our life is less than it should be. It suffers. We may think we're doing okay. It's only because we don't have any idea how good it could be. What would happen if God breathed into it? You are in a war. And here's the battle. The battle is to surrender our sarks, our body, to the pneuma, to his spirit. It's a war every single day. You don't fight this war once and it's done. It's a daily, sometimes minute by minute battle where you say, I got to lay down my will. God, you do this. You are in a war. The battle is to surrender our spirit to his, our breath to his. There's a story about uh, former attorney general of the United States, John Ashcroft. He was a governor at the time, of Governor Missouri. He had just been elected. His family was gathered, and they were celebrating the election. And uh, his father, who was J. Robert Ashcroft, who used to be the president of the school we went to, Valley Forge, uh, University of Valley Forge, um, was there, was an older man at the time, and uh, they were all gathered around, and they said, okay, let's gather around and, like, just pray and just thank God for what he's doing and, and you know, for the, just, you know, pray over John and just so grateful for all this. So he was on a couch. The, 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 the father was on a couch, and he was, like, struggling, like, because his you know, legs weren't working as well, and he was, and, and his son walked over and said, Dad, Dad, you don't, have to, you don't have to struggle to stand up. And he said to him, I'm not struggling to stand struggling to get on my knees. That's what it looks like. Every day we've got to struggle to get on our knees and submit ourselves and say, not my spirit, not my will, yours be done. God, don't let me operate in my own power. I need to operate in yours. If God has prompted your heart to speak to the bones of a relationship, then he is ready and willing to breathe breath into it, to breathe his spirit, the wind, the four winds into it. But you've got to submit your spirit to his. 
God says, I want to do this, but it's got to start with you. You've got to be willing to get out of the way. Because when God breathes into a relationship, do you know what happens? It's pretty cool. Paul continues in that same verse. Verse 22, he says this, but the Holy Spirit, right, the breath of the wind, produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. God's got good breath, especially compared to us. There are plenty of times we don't have what it takes to do right in a relationship. You want it to be good, then you know that you're not where you need to be for that day. We're tired, we're weak, we've got baggage, we've got all sorts of stuff that holds us back. But the Holy Spirit comes with the power of the four winds, and he gives you the power to love when you don't feel like it. Gives you the power, gives you joy when you usually complain. Fills you with peace when you would typically be anxious. Empowers you to be patient when frustration would get the best of you. Prompts you to be kind when you've got no filters left. Anybody? I know it's not you, but you know somebody. <laughs> Compels you to do good when you're inclined to serve self. The Spirit will keep you faithful when you're prone to wander. Will make you gentle when your New Jersey might show itself. It gives you the power to be self-controlled when you just want to let it rip. When you just want to do whatever you want to do. You don't feel like being tied down. See, our breath is awful. And God's breath is life-giving. Here's a life principle, ready? <laughs> If somebody offers you a mint, take it. That's it. That's the life principle. If somebody offers you a mint, you take it. That's just, <laughs> don't ask questions. Just put it in your mouth and say thank you. That's it. I encourage you, think about this every single time you wake up in the morning and you're like, oh, I got morning breath. Every time you brush your teeth. Think about the fact my breath stinks, God's breath is good. Every time you see a mint or put in a piece of gum, my breath stinks, God's breath is good. You're never going to brush your teeth the same way again. I'm telling you, every time now, his breath is always better than yours. The breath of God doesn't just magically change our relationship, though. It's not like God just says, hey, okay, I'm going to breathe and get away and I'll fix it all. No, what happens is he changes us. That's what he does. He changes us. We are no longer who we were. If you've ever played golf, just before hitting the ball, you may have seen someone lick their finger and stick it in the air or grab some grass and kind of throw it up. Anybody ever seen anybody do this on a golf course? Right? What are they doing? Testing the wind. Testing the wind. Seeing which way the wind blows. Because you can tell the directions are blowing east, it's blowing west. You know, For me, it doesn't make a difference. I do, I'm just going to grip and rip. That's it. I don't care where the wind's blowing. It doesn't matter. It's not going to affect my ball. It's going in the woods either way. All right? That's it. In our lives, there's really only two directions that matter. It's not east, west, north, south. The here's the direction that matters. Is the wind blowing into your life or is it blowing out? It's the only question that matters. If it's blowing inside out, from in out, that's carbon dioxide and it's coming from you. And it's not going to add life to anything. The trees will use it, but you're killing all your relationships. But if it's outside in, if the Spirit of God is breathing into you first, if the Spirit of God is breathing in and you've got his wind and his power, then we have oxygen, pure life coming into us. So the question again, which way is the wind of your life blowing? Does God have permission to breathe into you? Or are you trying to do it all in your own strength? I'm going to invite the band up. We're going to close in just a moment. So knowing all that is great. It's a great, nice message. Yeah, it's pretty cool. We, you know, learn to take a mint. So what do we do with that? Like, what do we do with that understanding? Like, what difference does that make when you walk out of here and you go right back to real life? You leave this glorious senior center. Then what? The point is this. God wants to fill you with his spirit. Today. Now. In this moment. So in a moment, I'm just going to give you a chance to do that. In a moment, I'm just going to ask. And 
We're going to say, God, would you fill us? It's nothing magic. It's nothing manufactured. Not asking for anything weird to happen, depending on what tradition you grow up in. But we're not asking for anything small either. When I, I, want, I, want to hear, I want you to hear this loud and clear. We're not asking for God to do just a little bit. If we're going to ask for God to fill us, we're, it's either the four winds or nothing. There's no, there's no little bit. You can welcome, as a pastor, you can welcome the Spirit. You can resist the Holy Spirit. But you cannot manage the Holy Spirit. The wind blows where it will. Either you say yes to God or you say no to Him. There's no controlling. Holy Spirit, breathe. Breathe into me. Breathe into my relationships. Sick and tired of speaking my garbage breath into everybody else, into my relationships, into my life. We're asking God to send His Spirit, the same Spirit that breathed life into Adam. The same Spirit that sent his son into this world, the same powerful wind that hovered over every part of creation, saying, God, would you blow without limit into us? It's time for us to stop trying to control what God does in our life. God, I need you to come and do what you will because it's good. It's powerful. It's life-creating. We react to so many things. I think we don't understand how good God is. We, at the end of the day, we just don't trust him. But if we feel like those relationships need to come back to life, if God has put it on our life, put it on our hearts, said, speak to these things, then there's only one way that happens. That's God. There's a prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed over his friends. It's a prayer I'd like to pray over us today. And after I pray that, I'm going to give an opportunity to you to simply speak to the dry bones in your life. To invite God to fill you with the full measure of his spirit. That's it. So I'm going to pray this. I'll give you a chance to pray, and then we'll sing. Invite God to do it. Not just talk, but do it. So would you, would you pray with me? God, I pray that from your glorious unlimited resources you will empower us with inner strength through your spirit. Christ, will you make your home in our hearts as we trust in you? Because if we will, if you will, then our roots will grow down deep into your love and keep us strong. And may we have the power to understand as all God's people should How wide, how long, how high, and how deep your love is. It comes from every corner. May we experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. It's a mystery. It's far beyond us, the full measure of who you are and what you do. But may we understand it so that we will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from your spirit, your breath, your wind. God, we ask you, Holy Spirit, begin to blow in this place. Lord, would your spirit descend in this room on us? All glory to you, God. You are able through your mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we could ask or imagine. Lord, no more limitations on you. Lord, you told us to speak to dry bones and they rose up. We speak to the dead places of our life. And now we wait. And Holy Spirit, we invite you to breathe in this place. So now it's your turn, church. It's time for God to take the dead and abandoned relationships in our lives and bring them not just back to some semblance of normalcy, but all the way to the complete fullness of the life and the power that God has ordained and it starts with his spirit breathing into us so right where you are in this moment i invite you just to ask the spirit of god to breathe into you 
Would you say, God, I welcome you. Holy Spirit, come into us today. Right here, right now, fill us with your breath. Just take a moment where you are. Ask God to come in. Ask God to come into your heart. Come into your spirit. And if you need to repent, if there's something that you say you've been in the way, God, we repent. God, forgive us. We're trying to will it our own way. Doing it our own power. Lord, there's a war inside of us. Lord, let us struggle to get on our knees and submit. Not just here and now, but every moment of every day, let us submit. God, we ask you, fill us in this moment. Speak to those places that need life. Just welcome God to speak into your life right where you are. Jesus, breathe. Breathe in us. 